This is the weakest Hemi I've ever put on my dyno. What? Hemis aren't weak. Let's make a test and see what it does. Welcome back to Nick's Garage. Nick and his guys have been taking old junk and building dreams with it for many years now. So these days, while the world is dealing with worrisome new threats, we're going to concentrate on providing you all with a welcome distraction and an oversized episode full of classic old school American muscle. There's always something great going on in the shop, but today Nick is returning to the roots of Mopar history and a 1954 241 Hemi. Okay, what we've got here is a 1954 Dodge Royale 241 Hemi. Of course, this is the second time I put the same engine like this on a dynamometer. It's also belongs to the same owner, which belongs to Joe. And of course, this is an engine that's been built by someone else, probably, I don't know, many years ago. And he told me, Nick, it's a running engine. And all he wants to do is just to put on the dynamometer and get it running, that's all. It's not exactly, I've got all the adapters. I don't have the correct flywheel. I don't have the correct bow housing or the starter. Because the starter that comes with this engine is a big, humongous piece that bolts onto an adapter plate, which I cannot fit on my dynamometer. So what I'm using here is a small block 340 uh, LA uh, A engine housing with a Hemi flywheel because it's an eight bolt crank. So I had to put bolts, there's no studs. I can't find a flywheel for this engine. So I did a few mix up pieces to get it going on a dynamometer. The only issue I got right now is that the starter doesn't line up perfect with the flywheel. So I gotta find a way to shim it and uh, get away from this noises that it creates. I don't know for some reason why on the first uh, 241 Hemi I did, I, didn't, I did not have any issues. I put a spacer washers on it and I got it going. So right now I'm gonna get it started so you can see what I'm talking about. And then I gotta find a way to quiet it down. You guys listen and see what you think, watch. Here we go. There it is. That's pretty loud. So you see, I gotta find a way to space it. So what I'm gonna do is right now, take off the starter, add some washers here and there, and uh, hopefully I get it uh, to quiet down. So let's take off the starter, Oliver, and uh, let's see what we can do. Yeah, it's a bunch of shavings over here. Yeah. You know what, uh, take it off. I'm gonna see if I can shim it in a different way. I sat here last night putting all kinds of shims, and you know what? I never cured a problem. But you know what, if I got it done on the first uh, 241, then I'm sure I can do it on the second 241. When Nick refers to his first 241 Hemi, he means this beautiful engine that he rebuilt and tested a few months back. He put every part of this one together himself, painted it the correct factory silver and red, and then bolted it to his dyno for testing. But the 241 he has in the shop today was built by someone else 
years and years ago, and it certainly didn't come with any guarantees. And this is a bridge we made uh, right here in-house with uh, Dan because uh, this block, as you can see, doesn't have motor mounts or any support for uh, motor mounts here on the side of the block. It's held underneath the uh, water pump with a bridge over the cross member. That's the way it was in the 54 Dodge. So then I couldn't put it here, so I made my own brace, as you can see, which is made in uh, painted red. Okay, it's got no rubber cushions, it doesn't matter. It's only a, a low horsepower engine, but it's gonna do the job. Like I said, we're just gonna make a few tests, only to see what kind of horsepower we have, what kind of oil pressure, and of course, we're not looking for anything special. Now, the, this is not the uh, oven housing four barrel intake with the four barrel setup. This is the two barrel setup. This should be a 140 horsepower engine. As you can see here, it's a little two barrel. And of course, this is, uh, this is strange. If you look over here, the body is made by Bendix and the choke housing is made by Stromberg. There we go. And of course, the, uh, what I like about this big tower right here is a breather. And that's, uh, of course, they, didn't, they did not have no PCV valve back in 1954. So they had this oil cap and a breather. And uh, right here, you see the opening for atmospheric pressure. But it works. You know, that's the way it was in 54, and it works. What do we got? With just one look at the starter, the guys can see exactly where all that noise is coming from. Or, you know what, take out all the shims and put these on. I'm gonna put uh, thicker washers. Here, put this on the top, between the starter and the uh, housing. Okay. And then I gotta find a washer a little bit thicker than that one so it can be balanced. Okay. And this is a two barrel version. I can't, wanna, I can't wait to see what it's gonna do. It's rated 140 horsepower at uh, what? Just uh, around 4,000 RPM. But we're gonna get it running from 2200 to 4200. Here we got a big motor, Hemi. Of course, uh, it looks big on the outside, but inside it's only a 241 cubic inch, and people are expecting big power. But you can't expect big power. It's a 1954, it's a little two barrel. You know, those days it were just an engine to uh, get going from A to B, I guess. But anyways, this is very interesting. I gotta see how it's gonna do. As you can see here, you got all four cylinders coming out right dead center in a small opening of one and a half inch, practically. Then again, I don't have any headers for this. Neither are we looking for horsepower. So for that reason, we left the exhaust manifolds on it. We attached our tailpipes, and of course, we're gonna do the test the way it is. We just gotta space it out perfect. I don't know how we're gonna do it. We'll take a few guesses. We'll take a few tries, of course, and see how it goes. I was very lucky on the first start on the first engine, but this one here is just seemed to be a problem. And of course, look, he brought me in a rough, Distributor, when I took a 340 electronic distributor, which bolts right on, look at it, electronic. Here it is, carbon A engine, electronic ignition, right here. Bolts right in, right into a 1954 Dodge. Check it out, eh, some things never change. Oliver, how's it going, buddy? Pretty good. Okay, as soon as you tighten it up, we're gonna go do another, uh, push that button and crank it over. You know what worries you, uh, we had a head running yesterday, uh, we cranked it over, it did not make any grinding noises whatsoever. The moment I revved it up, the noise came in, and then it just wouldn't go away. You know what they say, right, with the old cars, the old cars had souls and the new cars don't. <laughs> There's an example. Coffee's ready, you guys. Oh, I was just about to ask. Okay, let's bolt it down, let's crank it. If it goes good, we'll go for a coffee. Let's hope, uh, fingers crossed, let's see how it goes. All you need is a push of a button. I won't start it, just crank it over. Too far away, see? Look at that. Doesn't want to crank it over, look at this. I'm gonna grab a coffee, we're gonna put it back, let's grab a coffee, we're gonna put it back with one shim. Okay, so let's grab a coffee. When the going gets tough, the tough get caffeinated.
This is what gets us going here, coffee. I, I wish I had the time to sit around and have a coffee. There's, uh, in this shop here, there's no time, you know? I've got cars to deliver, I've got engines to build. There's some more coming in, so I don't want to be uh, backlogged, so I just keep moving. Here we go, two shims, three shims, and you know what? This is the time you have to put in when you have a non-common engine. That's funny, we put two little washers and it doesn't want to catch. Okay, that's strange. You know what, we're gonna put it on without any shims, without any washers whatsoever. Let's see how it goes. The only issues I have with the starter is because this is not the, uh, we got mixed up parts here trying to get this engine running on the dynamometer. That is the reason why uh, we have this, uh, Noise is going through the starter. We got the flywheel touching the starter because I don't have the right space. As you can see here, bell housing a block. Look what we've done. Because my uh, friction plate attached to the flywheel is touching the bell housing. So what I got to do is I got to bring the engine further away from the housing, which I did with the big nut spacers. And then of course, now you have to adjust the starter to line up with the flywheel. And this is what we were having an issue with. We're gonna see if I can fix it without using any shims whatsoever and see how it goes. Oliver, we're gonna try with no shims, okay? Okay. I doubt if it's gonna work. I really doubt it. You know what, I'm gonna take a look underneath after. There you go. Look at that, eh? Now it's too far away. There you go, Wrap it on for me. Okay, let's see how it goes. Well, now I don't want to go. This is funny, they painted corporate blue, 1954. I don't think blue was common in those years. You know, after building so many engines in my life, you know, street racing, uh, drag racing, we built a lot of racing engines, a lot of cruising motors. This was built and designed way before I was born. And it was something different. It's something new, why not? But it's a typical uh, push rod engine, piston engine, V8, it's all the same. Actually, nothing changed, even till today. Same thing, intake manifold, cylinder heads, spark plug wires, carburetor. Okay, today we have fuel injection, but we still use this technology for racing in uh, race cars today. Well, if you want to compare this to a 426 Hemi, of course, all the Hemis on the street from 66 to 71 had two full barrels, eight barrels, versus this little cubic inch 241 with a little two barrel. And I'm sure this engine could have used a much bigger carburetor. But then again, there was an option with an Ovenhauser intake manifold for four barrel setup. But in this case, we got a two barrel setup. This is the way it came from the factory on this car. And that's where we're gonna run it. Okay, now we put the starter back on with any shims whatsoever. Let's try it out. Okay, wait, now let's get it started. Let me put back on my O2 sensor. It's one thing making a noise, cranking it over, and it's another thing when the starter lets go and the engine runs on its own. So it has to disengage, then we gotta make sure the housing is not touching the flower wheel. Okay, here we go. Now, you know what we need? Put in one shim just to back it off a bit. What do you think? We're gonna keep trying until we get it. I am just curious to see what this engine is gonna do. It wasn't built by us, but again, it's on the dyno and let's see what it does. Of course, we use the uh, oil pressure. This is the oil pressure setup. We got this line going for the gauge. 
And I've got the sensor here that when it activates, I believe it's under 10 PSI. When it goes under 10 PSI while the engine is running, the red light comes on here. And some people call it the idiot light, which is, in my phrase, is the wrong thing to say. Whoever says it's an idiot light is an idiot because you know why? Like airplanes, when something goes wrong, you have lights. Of course, everybody has gauges. You have lights to give you a warning or even flash, okay? There's nothing better than a light going flashing in your face that tells you warning. So don't call it an idiot light because that's one of the best things around. You know, you're driving a car down the street. You're not always focusing on the gauges, but you know when you're driving and then a red light comes on, it wakes you up. So don't call it an idiot light. That's the best warning thing you could have in front of a, a dashboard. And don't you guys forget that. Okay, here we go. I'm trying to get this done before Joe comes in. There's nothing, there's nothing better than warning lights. Look, everything I've got here is warning lights. I got a blue light for the water pump. I got ignition, which is also key on low oil pressure. I've got the green light on for fresh air, as we can see here. Right here. Of course, when the engine's running, you don't hear the fan. And then, of course, I've got this warning light. I'll show you right now. When I forget to turn on the water line, there it is. And of course, there are dyno, the absorber, works on a water pressure, and this is our water line. And I have the light telling me that the valve is shut. So when you open the valve, the light goes off. And there you have it. So warning lights, you cannot beat them, just like in an airplane. I'm just gonna crank it, all right? Let's see how it goes. Ready? Okay, let's get it started now. You don't know until you get it running, so. You know what, worst comes to worst, if it makes a little noise, we're gonna leave it. We're just gonna make a couple of pulls because we're not here to see how the starter lines up with the flywheel. We're just here to see how the motor runs, make a little test, and that's about it. Once he puts his engine in his car, he's got the original torque converter, the original housing, the original starter, so you'll have no issues whatsoever. It's only sending it up here on my dynamometer. So it looks like we're gonna spend more time trying to get the starter working than doing it, the assembly, or should I say the installation of this uh, engine on the dyno. You know, like I've got things to do right now. I got a 446 pack to put together. I got a 340 lining up to go on the dyno next. So let's get this going, and here we go. It's gonna be a little bit uh, tricky to get this going. Yeah. No, I just hope it wears out. Here we go. I can't figure this out. This is how it comes from the factory. Here, it's got this big plate between the transmission and the motor, the engine. And this is where the starter bolt's on, you see? It's got a big, humongous cast iron starter. And of course, it's got the torque converter with the studs going through the flywheel into the crank, which we don't have this set up on this uh, dynamometer. And for me to do it, for me to customize every piece to machine it to make it fit perfect, it's gonna cost me a lot more than building this uh, any particular engine. So in this case, we're just gonna do what we can. It's not like we do these old Hemis very often, but we've done one before and we're gonna do it again. Another day, another problem. I don't know, I was lucky to get it the first time. I played a few shims on the first engine we built with a that we installed on the Dynamometer 241, we had no issues. Okay, it took us a while to set it up, but this one seems to be taking forever. 
But you know what? Uh, it is what it is. We're just gonna make the test the way it is. I don't care. We gotta get in the in the engine room and start building some engines here. This is nothing special. We just want to make a test to see what it does, and that's it. It's not we're gonna do testing over testing over testing that we need to get the starter working fine. It's all tight. All tight. Let's try it out. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, let's start it. Besides it started going uh, noisy, coming a lot of noise out of it, it's a lot of vibration. It's a lot of vibration. The more they adjust the starter, the more the engine is fighting them. And now it's creating some nasty vibrations that were not there on earlier tests. The client will be in soon, and this simple start it up and see how it runs dyno test is starting to eat up Nick's entire day. It's a lot of vibration. I'm sure that flywheel, uh, it's not perfect on the crank, I'm sure. I don't know for some reason why. Someone else built this engine, I'm sure it's neutral, balanced internally. There's no weights on the uh, harmonic balancer, there's no weights on the uh, uh, flywheel, or should I say the torque converter that it comes from. There's no external weight, so I'm sure it's an internal balanced motor. My flywheel is internal balanced, or should I say neutral, zero, balance. So what's causing this vibration, I'm not sure. Did you feel it? Did you see the yeah, starter moving? Yeah, That's it. the vibration. That's not uh, nothing loose. But he's not about to give up now. So Nick unbolts the bell housing so he can see exactly where this jury rigged setup is going wrong. Is it this that's out of round? Well, you know what? I'm going to loosen all six bolts. I'm going to see if there's any play. Okay. They're all 916 bolts. I'm trying to figure out why we have a wobble. Uh, oh, while we're cranking right. over, the flywheel seems to be going up and down. For some reason, maybe the friction plate is not well, or the flywheel to the yeah. crankshaft. We're not sure. What do you need? Then again, you know, this flywheel is not designed for this engine. You know that, eh? Okay. I've used this flywheel many, many, many times. I never had this issue. Put Turn it over and just see what it does. See if you how much play you have. Oh, we have a lot of play. I'm sure. I because saw if it. the play's here, it could be your. Uh, I saw it while we cranked it over. So it's the flywheel itself. Yeah. It's grinding. No, 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 yeah. no, no. It's not the flywheel itself. It's, it's the, the way it's made it to the crank. Yeah. To the crankshaft. And we don't know if the crank is. Uh, I don't know that. It's not an unusual situation for Nick. When he finds himself with engines that other people have put together, he often has more questions than he does answers. It's not this, it's this. It could be. It's At which point not we have to put a hub? Because there's no hub on the then we take We take measurements and we make a hub. Hold on, let me go in the back. We got a wobble with the flywheel in the back there, so we're going to put a dial decade on the rear flange of the crankshaft. We're going to turn over the crank to see if it's uh, uh, out of roundness or whatever. Here we go. Okay? Yeah. Dead center. Don't you go full turn, Nick? You're good. Okay, ready? Yeah. Go. You're good. I'm good, eh? Yeah. So it's off-centered. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the problem is, 
the flange was going up and down against the uh, flange on the crankshaft. Right. So we got to find a way to make it sit. We take a measurement of the hub, take a measurement of that hub, and you make a uh, spacer. Oh, I'm gonna oh, run the machines up, keep this here another week on the dyno, it ain't gonna happen. I'm gonna guess on it. There's no way, uh, I'm okay, not getting paid for this, so this is a lot of time I put into this. you gotta learn on Saturdays. Everything comes in at once. Okay, here we go. Here, hang it. See this? Thank you. Find the uh, outside diameter. It. I'm gonna find you a couple of rings that might line up. Nick would love to be able to have the time to spend the whole day in his dyno room troubleshooting the old Hemi. But he's got a shop full of other customers and more lined up outside. So it's time for a quick old school fix that'll get them through this dyno test. Manny spent a lot of time in his youth on a farm, fixing a tractor before he was old enough to drive a car. And he's got an old school trick for making parts that don't fit, fit. After spending several more hours than usual wrestling with the little old Hemi, Nick gets the 1954 Dodge hooked back onto his dyno. He hasn't had time to even start it when his client Joe walks in, wanting to see the engine run. Get this out of here, gas pedal, intake bolt is on, intake bolt is on. I guess we're ready. I ordered you a new filter and a new oil. I didn't change it yet, but we got good oil pressure. You're gonna see it now. Matter of fact, I made some tests last night, but I wanna make sure, uh, I'm not gonna tell you anything until you see it here live in front of the video and all the viewers here watching us on YouTube. Let's see, let's see how it cranks. Here we go. And now, let's see if it starts. Hemi is bucking like a bronco on the dyno. But Nick's a cowboy. He's not about to stop now. So far so good, it's better than before. Okay, let's warm it up.
Look at the idle. 700 RPM, eh? Look at the oil pressure. So far, so good. Okay, let's make some, man. Let's see if we rev it up what happens. I'm gonna start at 2200 RPM and I'm gonna finish at 4200 RPM, okay? Alright. It's a 241 cubic inch. Here we go. Here we go. I like that steady idle. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Now we'll go. It's eight off. Here, let the starter, don't worry, it's off loose. It sparks, isn't it? That's the starter there. It keeps getting loose on me. Here, Joe. Check it out. We did a few tests. I'm gonna tighten up the starter. We'll make another test back to back, okay? okay. So 4200, it's uh, 147. We have, yeah, 117. But you know what? Let's, let's uh, do another test back to back. Because it should be around uh, 39, 4000 RPM, your maximum horsepower. Not here. Usually I never count the first test of the day. I let a uh, heat sink into the cast iron, and now we're gonna do start, uh, now we're gonna start testing. Let Oliver tighten up the starter again. You see the, uh, how the uh, starter keeps getting loose? Did the shims drop out? Yeah, only one time back. You put it back? Yeah. Okay, let's make another test back to back. I played with the time yesterday. This is where it is at the best, best place. All right. All right, Here let's try go. it again. Here we go. I'm surprised. Uh, usually came in before 4200 RPM. Okay. Go ahead, put the fan on. Here we go. Come on. Got a little misfire here, right? I gotta go more than 4200 RPM. Look, it's still climbing. We're still climbing. Even the torque is there. Okay, I'm gonna make another test back to back. Here we go. Oh, that's Start is gonna fly off. Yeah. Okay, here we go. We're still climbing, man. I mean, I don't, I don't think you're gonna rev this thing more than 4,200 RPM. 
This is what we had yesterday, which makes more sense. Take a look at that. It's in within the 4200 RPM. You see it? Mm -hmm. So it's the same power. 122, 127. We're in the same range. Let's hear if the engine's holding together. There's no noises. Oil pressure's good. See it? 57? There's no mechanical noises. Let's go listen to it. No oil leaks whatsoever. Come and see this. And all you hear is the starter, okay? That's the starter. But listen to the motor. I got you a brand new distributor, okay? Right. The other one belongs to the 354. The carburetor is okay? Yeah, yeah, it works. We did the best we can with the flywheel. Look at that. Crack the valves. That's why I got different numbers. But I'm telling you, yesterday we had it uh, much smoother, but for today we tried to even set up much smoother, but we couldn't. But we cracked the bell saying I'm not going to do any further testing. But in the meantime, these are your real numbers right here. And there you have it, Joe. So now you get the, all of it ready for you next week so you can take it home. Yeah. Not bad, eh? I don't know how many years ago it's been built, but it still runs good. Of course, we can't get the flywheel perfect 100%, but you got the numbers I've shown you, and of course, we're gonna have to send this out for welding. And we have the perfect man, Dan, is gonna take care of that. So folks, it turns out that the weakest engine that Nick has ever tested is this little old Hemi that was strong enough to break his dyno. <laughs> Here we got the weakest Hemi on the dynamometer, we break the bell housing. It's nothing major. We're going to weld it up in place and uh, put it back in the future for the other engines. But in the meantime, at least we got this one running. Just a couple of sparks. A no couple of sparks, but that, like I said, it was just a starter in the flywheel, but that's nothing concerned with the engine. It's part of the dyno setup. But besides that, it's all good. Okay, Joel. Take care. Take care. Stay tuned and, of course, subscribe, you guys. Subscribe. And get your friends to join you and watch us. And, of course, thank you all. And you guys, if you look down below the video, we have a whole bunch of merchandise that you guys can buy. So whatever you like, buy it, love it, wear it, and enjoy it. And help spread the word of Nick's Garage. And if you have some time, check out our Patreon page. We have extra content and you guys can watch it and take it from there. And we'll see you next time.